but it seems like overall couples are, have a higher propensity to just say, this is hard. I'm out. I think there is some truth to that. Keep in mind, like the relationship I'm aiming for, for them is very different from the average relationship out there that survives and makes it like the, if that's, if that's the bar, yeah. I'm actually aiming for a higher bar. <laughs> So take a moment right now, maybe close your eyes and think of that most important person in your life, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whoever it is. Are you smiling? Are you smiling on the inside? Uh, does that person's voice still get you excited when you hear it for the first time? Or maybe when you see them for the first time in the morning, or maybe you're living together and you're not even connected, or maybe it's worse. Maybe you're just done. You're done. You want out. There's no way back. Right. Or is there? Today's guest, Ken Blackman, has spent 25 plus years working with what he calls precipice couples, people on the very verge of relationship destruction, and he helps them rediscover the connection and see the value in the relationship that they once had. Today, this is your chance to see how good or maybe how not so good you have it with your relationship from a man who has pretty much seen it all, Ken Blackman. Ken, welcome to the show, buddy. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, every couple has rocky times, right? So it happens to everyone. Yeah. If your relationship has lost its spark, how do you get it back? Yeah, I mean, you're right. There's, you know, there's there's a, a world of what that could mean. Do you know what I mean? Like I, what I end up doing is having a long conversation with each of them and to see, you know, what's going on and, and what they what originally brought them together. Because what I found is most of the time, believe it or not, people don't break up because of problems. They break up because the good isn't good enough anymore or hmm. the good just isn't good enough to do the work, you know, to, to get because the problems are solvable. And so I love to start with what's what brought you together? What do you love about your partner? Like, it's easy for us to be here talking and you're telling me all of the really messed up stuff and all the reasons, you know, why you're struggling or you've lost the spark. Great. We can talk about that. Now, now tell me why I should care about your relationship. Tell me why, in spite of all that, you're sitting here, you know, with a coach hoping to get it back. Let's start with the good and see where you got off track with that. That's, if there's one thing, it's, I would say it's that. I love that. That makes it positive. So it's not like they're coming into your office and complaining about each other. You're saying, okay, let's go to what was really good one time and revisit that. Does that work? Does it help? It, it absolutely does. And the reason is, I mean, I might be, I might be jaded, but people come in really trying to convince me why their relationship isn't going to work. Hmm. And it's hard because the recoveries, the bounce backs that I've seen, like major issues, major problem. I mean, you know, like they, they disagree about things. They're, they're not well matched. They, they have problems in the bedroom. They fight all the time. Like it could be the problems are solvable if the good in the relationship is is worth what it takes for them to actually make the difficult changes. And so for a long time, you know, I like working with couples for a long time. I worked with couples who were committed because they have skin in the game. Like I'm going to ask them to do hard things. I'm going to ask them to look, do a deep, deep look at the way they are and make difficult changes. So they, they better have skin in the game that makes it worth it. You're trying to remind them of what that skin was. And then have them tell me if it's worth it. There's times when I get on a call with someone and I'm talking to them. You know, what I do is first I ask a lot of questions. I don't, you know, I just listen and I ask questions until at least one of them, like I can see the world through their eyes. I understand, like I get it. I really can feel where they're coming from, what they're experiencing. Then I talk to the other one and I get to where I can see, see the world through their eyes. But sometimes I'm talking to someone and I'm like, to myself, I'm thinking, this person feels like they're done, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's a, there can be a moment 
where someone internally says, I'm done. They don't say it out loud. You know, they are not saying it in the, in the call, but there might be this thing that I feel. And so then I'll, 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 I might stop and I say, Hey, can I talk to this person alone for a second? And I'll say, tell me the truth. Are you, are you done? Like, are we doing, I 100% understand due diligence and doing everything you can. But t between me and you right now, do you, are you are you done? Like, are we really talking about? I like y you're tapped out. It's not you. You don't have anything more to to give. And if that's the case, that becomes the conversation that we have. Do you know oh, what I mean? No. Like, I I'm not I'm not wedded to what the what the outcome is. What I'm wedded to is an outcome that is better than what they have right now. Can somebody come back from being done? They can, but we have that conversation. It's not going to be me convincing them. It's in their court, not for me to change their mind or even for their partner to change their mind. Like, but for them to say, look at, oh, look at why, what I'm walking away from if I walk away from this. Mm -hmm. So that brings it back to what is it? What, what do you have? What is there that, that is driving what this relationship has been? And if it's not what you want anymore, then then I will help you guys uncouple amicably. Like I, I'll have you break up and have a better a better relationship with each other than 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 the one that, that we're dissolving. Okay. Right? We'll craft a new a new way of relating that isn't you guys talking about each other as a couple. Wow, that's valuable. It's yeah. really valuable. I wonder if, if you've ever had to say to somebody like, "This is too far gone. I can't help you," or if you just will help in any scenario. No, no. In the coaching world, you know, it, it can be hit or miss. If it misses, I consider that a failure on the coach's part to vet the the, the coaching relationship. I want to know, are they coachable? Because it could be, it could be that one of them, I can sense that they're just not going to change. They can talk about all these things that they want to change, but I can sense like we have a conversation like at, you could call it a sales process, but it's really a getting to know you process before we actually decide, okay, this is good. We talk and talk. We have a conversation. I talk to them maybe a week later and nothing that we talked about the previous week has sunk in. I'm wondering to myself, number one, are they coachable? So that's the first question. The second question is, do they have problems that I actually believe they can solve? And then do I feel capable of actually guiding them to the place where they can solve those problems? So there's a bunch of questions that need to be answered. Once we get to the place where all of us are like, we are all feeling good about this, there's a very high probability that it's going to go well. So I have to leave them like having feeling successful and like it was like the whole thing was worth it to them. What do you think is like the the best, you know, question that you ask to couples to get to the core? Is there one? I'm sure that's a, I'm, I know you have a ton of questions you ask, but is there one that you're like, oh, this is one that's going to get me in? I've already shared my trick question. The, the trick question is, okay, I, I, you're, you've done a really good job of telling me all the problems that you have. Tell me what's good about this relationship. Or tell me what was good about it. Tell me how you met. What was it about them that caught your eye? What, what was it that had you think, oh, this might be more than just an acquaintance? Like, you know, let's talk about what's there yeah. that's worth saving. That, 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 if there's a trick question, it's that. I once heard somebody say that marriage is falling in and out of love constantly. It's just this cycle. You're in love, you're out of love. You're in love, you're out of love. So that seems to suggest that the successful marriages are playing the long game. They understand that and they they have a long-term view of their relationship. Like my parents, in that generation, you didn't get divorced. You were together forever. And then I, I think the rate's around 50% overall. And I know it depends on when you get married, at what age, you know, that's a bit first marriage, second marriage. I have those stats actually, which are fascinating. But it seems like overall, there isn't, a, there's an easier, couples are, have a higher propensity to just say, this is hard, I'm out. Um, now versus back in the day. What are you seeing? Yeah, um, I think there's, there's, there's some truth to that. Keep in mind, like, the relationship I'm aiming for for them is very different from the average relationship out there that survives and makes it. Like the, if that's if that's the bar, yeah. 
I'm actually aiming for a higher bar. And so there's a few other, there's a few other factors. I'll say the way I would say it, and you can see if this matches what, what you're talking about. So first of all, um, and this is something my wife taught me actually. <laughs> Does she that know? There is this way in which you, you make a decision that you're going to maintain your own high regard for your partner. So she's very protective of her high regard for me. That gives her the freedom to be angry at me, to be hurt, to be disappointed, and to talk to me to actually have those feelings come up. She's not going to say she's not going to suppress the feelings. She's actually going to feel those feelings because the only way you can really deal with emotions is to feel them, to actually have, have the emotion, feel the emotion and express the emotion. So she can do all that. What happens is when someone gets angry, there's a difference between being angry and being vindictive, being hurtful, being like letting your view of the, your partner do drop into contempt. Mm -hmm. Like once you're contemptuous, that is a that is a failure on your part. Mm -hmm. So so there's this baseline of high regard that we hold for each other that we ourselves protect our high regard for each other. It's not their job to like they she's earned it. I've earned it. You know, so so that actually le leaves freedom to get angry at each other without wreckage. So that's the first piece. There's another piece, which is whether you're in relationship to get your needs met or because you you love being in relationship. If it's like you're in relationship to get your needs met, you you're already casting it like going to work to get the paycheck. So you can either go to work to get the paycheck or you can love the work that you do. You can be passionate about it. You can cook because you have to eat or you can like get into the cooking classes and you can get into the, you know, like I want to learn like these cuisines and you're super into it. So I, I am into relationship. We have hard conversations. We say uncomfortable things to each other. We admit uncomfortable things about ourselves. We call each other out. I don't experience it at as work, I experience it as relationship is my jam. The messed up thing that nobody talks about is you can love the perks of relationship, what you get from the relationship. There's times when I, it's so uncomfortable and painful, the things that, that we're saying to each other, but underneath that, I love every minute of it. In the same way, like a skateboarder who's trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing, he tries 50 times, 100 times, it's one really difficult thing. It's work and it's hard, but underneath it, he loves every minute of it. So I think there's a switch where you can say, relationship is my jam, marriage is my jam, and I'm going to savor every single minute of it. Does that make sense? Yes, it's like mindset. It's a mindset. It's yeah. like anything else. You just have to have the right mindset. It's mindset. I love that thing your wife taught you. Know, how I'm holding yes. you in high regard. I and love I'm protecting that. that. You've talked about something called relationship ESP. Do you want to talk a little bit about that here? Because I think it's pretty fascinating. There are times when um, she says, I wish he could just know. <laughs> and he says, I wish she could just like overtly express what, you know, what she wants. And so there's this dynamic tension and I believe actually that she's the one that's right about this. We as men can develop or, or those of us who think more in terms of, I pride myself on my rationality. I pride myself on my productivity. I pride myself on, I don't know, like my ability to be, to be an earner. Like I pride myself on, on being, being a leader, being like the one who, who takes the lead, whatever that list is, right? What we aren't taught is the, the actual skills of relationship, which are nonverbal, they're intuitive. The example I give is, okay, they're sitting there watching TV. She wants him to do the dishes. He knows that she wants him to do the dishes. He's upset with her because she's not coming out and asking him to do the dishes. And because she's not doing that, he's going to hold it against her and just not do it. Well, you know, if that's what you're feeling, then come out and tell me. So what I have to say to the guy is, dude, if you know she wants you to do the dishes, then she communicated. Hmm. 
Wow. He has made all the communications that she, she needs to make for you to know. And you are doing her a dis disservice by pretending not to know. And so I start to show him that there are things he does know that he that he ignores because we've been trained not to listen to that. Well, I've been trained that if I if I have a feeling that I want to kiss her, I've been trained, no, I have to wait until I get an overt, like, you know, consensual. And that's there's reasons why those why cons consent and all those things are in place. But it forecloses on all the things that can happen, for example, in the bedroom if he starts to listen to his accurate spidey sense, instead of playing Simon Says, where she has to tell him everything what to do before he does it. And so there is a way that he can actually start to get to know her so well. He's doing what it is that she wants before she even opens her mouth. And it does feel to both of them like ESP. And so I've developed ways of teaching the couple. He can't do it alone, but I teach the couple how to cultivate that skill in him so that in and out of the bedroom, he actually starts to feel like, oh, I, I don't know how I know. I just have this hunch yeah. and, and I'm going to trust it and listen to it. And oh my God, how accurate it is when he starts to develop it. So let me talk about the other side of the coin. So I'm a sex and relationship coach. I teach this stuff. I, you know, do you know how f***ed I am if I... I'm not willing to say, I don't know how to touch you right now. Can you, can you show me? Like if my ego has gotten so big that I presume that I know, and when, when actually I, I don't know, you need both. You need to be able to ask. You need to be able to actually, if she feels comfortable telling you what she wants, it helps to be receptive to that and to listen to that, which not everyone is, you know, not everyone listens to their partner who, who's telling them what it is that they want. So you do need to be receptive. But, but once it gets to a place where you do know, and really your only gripe is that is her style of communication. Her style of communication is the style that makes relationships 10 times better, not the, the formal written out contract or the instruction manual that, that men uh, lean on and expect, you know, like, I can't do it until you give me the, the instruction manual. Mm. I can't go shopping until you give me the list. I can't, you know, I'm, in, I'm incapable. Because and to be fair to men, like, there's, again, a reason why they're like this. They've tried to tell the man side, they've tried, she shot stuff down. Mm. It can be that she's so controlling, right? That She's there's a very narrow path for him to 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 follow to get it right. <laughs> and so he's okay. only going to succeed if she's actually giving him instructions. So the whole thing is not working for both of them. She's being too controlling and too criticizing and not enough space for him to actually learn. He maybe doesn't listen enough or has become powerless. He's become incapable. No. We're going to dismantle all of that. She's going to show him what she wants. He's going to actually start to develop his capacity to know, but not know how he knows and listen to that and, and hone and polish it. This is relationship ESP. Does it make sense? Oh, it's fabulous. You mentioned that you work with couples uh, about sex. So I have, you know, of course I have like t at least 10 Two pages. <laughs> <Sex questions. laughs> no, I'm just kidding. no. So the first question I thought of was, so a lot of, you know, I'm, I've been in a marriage for like 10, 15 years and a lot of people that I know have been in marriage for a long time and when that happens sometimes it's not like you don't want to have sex but sex can stall like right and then it's like all of a sudden weeks and months and there's some people that are very, very consistent with it but for, for those that do have the stalling, how can you rev it back up again? How can you, what advice do you have for sex stalled yeah. couples? So... I go back to the very basics, the very fundamentals of what sex is, like what, what is pleasurable to the body? What feels good to the body? And so um, I, I, put, uh, I put the body front and center. Think of it this way. You cook dinner a couple times a week together. You cook dinner together and you eat it, you enjoy a good meal. You would both have different food preferences. You got to figure that out. 
that gets figured out. It's not a big deal. It gets figured out. You figure out how to get up from the table, both of you having had a really good meal and neither of you having to eat anything that you didn't want to eat, right? Same in the bedroom. It, you can figure out how both people can get something that feels good to them without having to do anything they actually don't li like or want to do. Well, we will figure that out. Then, because you're doing this a couple times a week, you try new cuisines, you, you figure out your flow in the kitchen, like, oh, I, I love cooking the steak. You love, you know, um, roasting the, the asparagus, right? And so pretty soon after five years, your meals are fantastic. They're dialed into you. And it wasn't that hard, you know? So I think the default can be that your sex is better five years from now than it was in the beginning. Wow. I think that's how it should be. Like my, my sex with my wife this month is better than it's been. And a year from now, it's going to be better than it is now. I think that's, that's how it should be. And again, I, I come back to the body. So nothing that doesn't feel good to your body. And how does your body actually like to be touched? If, if, you, if you only want to be touched here in this particular way for five minutes, that's what you do. And once your body learns that it is only going to have good experiences, then it's going to start, start to want more. Mm -hmm. Your body is going to actually want, oh, I, let's do that again tomorrow. Oh, let's do that, you know. And from there, from those very humble beginnings, where you just put a rule, we're only going to do things that feel good. And you start with whatever that is, five minutes of this kind of touch. And that's it. You stop when you're done. Or you change when you don't like it anymore. From those very humble beginnings and sticking with that, you can get into profound, fantastic, delicious, amazing, connected sex. I think that the, the potential for sex with someone you're actually doing this with over time far exceeds anything like going out and finding someone new. Do you think then... Like, if you're out of practice, should you schedule it? Like, because I feel like it takes away from the romance. Yeah. Right? So keep in mind this idea that it has to be romantic. <laughs> or it, it, originally it was fueled by romance. And that's fine. I don't want to take away from that. But that's not working anymore. And it didn't get you into the territory you wanted to. Like, both of you, I'm assuming... Both of you actually like sex and want sex, but you've gotten to a place where it's just dead. So what's happened is the game has changed. There's this fantastic quote by Joni Mitchell, where she talks about how if you want the same experience again and again and again, you keep seeing new people. If you want endless variety and new, 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 you stay with the same person. Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. Wow. Yeah, you know, like schedule it. To answer your question, yes, schedule it. Find out what you what your body likes now that's different from what it liked a couple of years ago. Do you think that monogamy is a natural thing? Man, that is a that is an amazing question. I have been in my life monogamous, and I have in my life been non -mon like practice like consensual non monogamy, meaning. I'm in, a, I'm in an ongoing committed relationship with someone and that does not exclude us having sex with other people. So I am not in a position, nor do I believe that one is better than the other. What I can tell you is in the relationship I'm in now, we're monogamous by choice, not because one of us would be upset if the other one Want, like if if one of us really felt drawn to somebody, you know, but we're monogamous because we like what we have at home. We've we've crafted, we've we've like created, we've built a relationship that's so good, so delicious, and so nourishing, just so good in so many different ways. Being with someone else doesn't sound appealing. How many people are coming to you saying they're opening their relationships? <laughs> that can't be a big number. You'd be surprised, Mark. I would be surprised. Is it growing? Mm-hmm. 15 to 20%. And 
it's just off the top of my head yeah, of, sure, as sure. I think back to like the last couple of years of people who have come to talk in. and they 20, 15, 20% and they stay together. They're happy in an open relationship. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking open marriage. Maybe is that different to you? Open relationship versus open marriage. You do both. The, well, think of it this way in a relationship, everyone has a line in the sand, right? Sure. The line that you, your partner is not to cross. On so on one side of the line is all the things your partner can do with anybody. Like if your partner wants to go, you know, hang with with her friends, and and uh, or you know, like there's lots of things that your partner can do with other people that you're happy. You're go go have a great time. On the other side of that line are the things you only want her to do with you. So it's just a matter of agreeing what you're okay with your partner doing. I don't think people leave each other for someone else. I think people leave each other because the relationship isn't strong. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of self-confidence, self-sourced self-worth. I know what my value is to my partner. I know the strength of our relationship to be able to say, go have fun with this other person. Come back, tell me all about it. Come back in better shape than you were before. Share all that juice with me. We'll have a good time over it. You know, whatever you whatever you experience that you like, let's see if we can incorporate it into art. Like it takes a high level of self-worth, a high level of confidence, a high level of trust and, and salt solidity in the relationship. And under those circumstances, it isn't threatening to have your partner have a rich full life and have fun, including maybe having sex with another human being. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Let me share some numbers with you. So I looked yeah. it up, 2024 stats on divorce. Great. Here are three numbers. 41% of all first marriages are ending in divorce. 60% of all second marriages. <gasps> and 73% of all third marriages. I have to tell you, that's the exact opposite of what I've always believed. I believe that you're mm -hmm. more successful if you get married the second time because now you've learned, you've made your mistakes. You've learned how to be married. You think. Right? Yeah. The, it, these numbers seem to indicate that you're learning how to, to get divorced better and better. S right. Three out of four third marriages are ending in divorce. What's your take yeah. on that? Off the top of my head, right? Yeah, like, totally. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull this one out of my ass. They said, the problem is over there. What I need to do is find the person who doesn't have all the problems of that asshole. I just walked away from hmm. we, including myself are not taught how to do relationship. Well, Right. I had to right. learn. I, it's not something that's taught in school. It's not something that's modeled on TV. Most of the most popular TV shows show really dysfunctional. Like people love watching dysfunctional. Like, I hate watching those dysfunctional relationship shows. People love that stuff. And so we're not t told how to do it. If you left your first marriage and blamed your partner, this is an, a partner optimization issue. I need to find the right partner who are probably things that you're, that you didn't figure out right. from the first, from the failure of the first marriage, because you blamed them. I looked up the top reasons, current top reasons for divorce, right? Now, right. everybody would say, oh, infidelity, infidelity, infidelity. That was number two, right? That was Mo number let me two. Guess. Okay. Let me guess. Money? 60%. No. Don't. Uh, oh, I'm not looking. Actually, money, I don't even know if it's, it's on here. Oh, Number is three money? is too much conflict and arguing. Number four, getting married too young, followed by financial problems. There okay, you go. Okay. Substance abuse, domestic Maybe. violence, lack of support from family, health problems, on and on and on. Number one, coming Wait. in at a whopping 75%. Wait, see if you can guess. I bet you can. I, it's kind of vague, so I'm not sure. No, you can't guess. I can't guess what, what people say, yeah. right, but I right. might be able to make sense of what, what they Well, that's why I want to ask you, because I need you to make sense of this. The answer was okay. lack of commitment, oh, which is clearly not referring to infidelity because that was number two. I would interpret this similarly to what I was talking about in the beginning of the call. Remember when I said people don't break up because of the problems, they break up because the good isn't good enough for them to have skin in the game to make it work. There you go. That probably, that's how I would interpret Someone saying, yeah, my partner just wasn't committed enough. The, I, it could be something along those lines is what is what's meant. 
Yeah, that's my guess, that they're just not all in. They know what needs to be done. They're not attentive. All those things. They're not willing to put in the work. They stopped trying. They stopped trying. And it, and, or the mindset is that it's work, just like you said in the beginning, and not that this is fun, it's my passion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just want to ask, like, you just mentioned that you were a software engineer. How did you get from there to this? <laughs> because you're like a guru now in this industry. And like, what was, yeah. what was the trajectory there? Yeah, so I obviously needed work myself. You know how they say the stuff you're naturally good at, you're not really good at showing other people, but the stuff you actually had to learn the hard way is the stuff that you can help other people with. So that's for sure me. I needed help learning. For the record, who I learned the most from was the women that I was relating with wow. and being willing to listen to them and actually take them seriously. How can we help you, Ken, to get out the word about whatever you want to get the word out? This is something we love to do here. You can send people to my website, kenblackman.com. You can also send people to my blog. There's a lot, if people like what they heard today, they will love reading. We, we've touched on a lot of things that I've written about in a lot more detail on my blog. So the blog is on medium.com. I'll give you the link. Please, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. So, yeah. Great. Great. Awesome. So I can't thank you enough. Incredible. It's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed every second of this. I have like 10 more sex questions that I'll ask next time. 10 more sex questions. <laughs> yeah, no, it's making Mark a little uncomfortable. That's so. an understatement. I'm sure. No, I don't mean that. I mean the number of questions you have. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Ken. Man. It's been great. We appreciate it. And thank all of you for watching. Thank you. And we'll see you very soon.